Alright guys, welcome back. I'm Neil. And I'm Dustin. This is Greek Gods and Human Myth Takes. In today's episode, we're going to be doing Perseus, the king of Argos and the hero of all heroes. Technically, not the king of Argos. Though. Not technically. But we'll but get into that yeah, later. That's to come. Teaser <laughs> alert. <laughs> All right, so before we get into that, I want to go into just a, a couple of details of what's upcoming and then kind of break some stuff down for you guys, give you a little bit better understanding of the the deeper meaning of the, the myths coming up in the future episodes and kind of help you understand why why some of the characters act the way they do in these future episodes and this episode. So this episode, I'm going to start it off with explaining just the, the, Greek, uh, the, uh, the Greek household. So... For them, the the way that a person runs his household is almost as important as the way that the citizens govern their body. Because as Aristotle puts it, it that some thinkers state that running an oikos is the same as running a polis. Just size is all that's different. So by saying that the way that a, a man runs his household is going to be the way that the, the government runs the, the polis. If you can't handle the small things, you're not going to handle the big. So on this episode, we're going to give you just a little snapshot of the way that the Athenians ran their, their government and just to give you a little, just a little deeper meaning to the way that the characters react in the myths and just kind of understand what's making their, their brains focus on it. And then following this episode, we're going to go straight into the Oedipus myth and do a couple playwrights following Dustin's chomping at the bit to do some Jason and the Argonauts. Yep. J and the A. Oh my God. <laughs> This is this is how you feel when I make bad jokes. So I, I get it now. Who's joking, bro? <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so to the Athenians, the most important element to their society is the oikos, which is their their family or their household. And everything that goes with the myths, you can kind of see is something that they're trying to explain on why things are happening the way they do. So for the most part, whenever you see a female that is having a female that either does some taboo crime like killing one of their kids or the the wife is just having an affair this is this is just kind of the insecurities that go in line with the the greek psyche so pericles passed a law that changed it so the only way that you could become a full-blown athenian citizen is if your mother and your father were both athenian citizens as well so in theory, this is a great idea. However, this created this crazy storm of the the aristocracy trying to control their women because all that would happen is if, let's say, your wife has an affair on you, then your political opponents can completely cast into doubt the lineage of all of your kids as well. So they would do these crazy things that sound really weird to us today, but we got to definitely take our own bias out. I know I challenge you guys with that a lot. But take your own bias out and kind of look at it in the Greek point of view. So obviously the Athenians were famous for their democracy, but the only people that actually had these rights were about 40,000 of the population. Sometimes they estimate about a grand total of 500,000, including prostitutes, slaves, uh, citizens, and wives. So of that 500,000, only... Roughly around forty to sixty thousand people had actual rights, and based on that, it's all going to be men. So all of your myths, you're going to notice that the the men are going to kind of kind of take control of the show. The the women have very few very few rights, except for once you get when we get to the next episodes, where it's going to be the tra uh, the tragedies or the comedies, where the the women actually start to kind of flip the script. But I just kind of wanted to get into just a few of those details to set up the next episodes and kind of let you let you understand just a, a few things that goes on. So if a wife cheats on her husband, the husband has the right, if he catches her in the moment, to kill both of them. Hmm. It's called a justified murder. However, if he doesn't, and it's premeditated, he still gets punished. If the What's the punishment? It it's a fine usually decided <laughs> by the jury <laughs> yeah it, women don't have much rights again <laughs> nope. um so then going into it the the woman is immediately she's divorced the man has no choice in it if he does not divorce her he loses his citizenship mm. if he loses his citizenship his kids are cast into doubt so with the athenians they have this or the athenians and all greeks essentially 
they have this strange idea that it's completely different to what we would see it as. It's curses that go, that are passed down. We talked about it a little bit in the Agamemnon episode um, where the, the son is cursed due to no fault of his own. It was his, his father. So that's why in a lot of these myths, you'll see just a, a, a city-state reacting to someone who is doing terrible things that could bring the wrath of the gods because it just takes one person. One person who doesn't fulfill his duty of honorably running his family that can completely destroy a city. And we're going to go into that next episode with Oedipus. The The gods have the right to be mad at one person, and it has ramifications for everybody. So there's four elements, according to Aristotle, that goes into the oikos. It is the oikos, sorry. It is the the household uh the leader of the household, which is the father. The father himself, he's in charge of three basic duties. His is just to provide for the family. He runs the, the family plans for the household, and then he's to defend the family if um, in times of war. And then his final one is keeping his family uh, well-maintained in the eyes of the gods. So we talked about that just a second ago. You can't go around committing incest, can't feed your kids to the gods, stuff like that, or else you'll completely destroy your own family and possibly the whole city. No big deal. The wife is completely subservient in Athenian culture. She is, if, if it's an aristocratic family, she is trapped up inside her house. So because the Greek or the Athenian men are so paranoid about fidelity and the lineage, they lock their wives up, which is... Again, really weird to think about for a democratic uh, country that we kind of think is the big deal, you know? So they locked him up, and they were barred from going to funerals because they were afraid that their women would pick up men at the funerals. So you know that scene in Wedding Crashers? <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thing. But also, here's the funny thing. It actually, there is historical evidence of uh, a woman who was accused of having an affair that, with a guy that she met at her mother-in-law or father-in-law's uh, funeral. So, oh. uh, yeah, that insult into injury. That's interesting. Yep. <laughs> interesting place to hook up. Yeah, I guess, you know, you know grieving. Maybe not grieving because it's your in-laws, but whatever. And then following that is the kids. The kids themselves are completely... They're, they're falling in line with the, the father. Obviously, in a patriarchal system, the sons have precedence over the daughters. Um, they'll even get more food and all this stuff. Um, women typically didn't get meat in this type of era either. Um, the men were the ones that were given the wine. Um, and if the uh, women did get wine, it was watered down, which kind of leads historians to believe that maybe this is just more indicative of whether or not the economy where they could actually provide that on a regular basis for the women so obviously they're going to give it to the men yeah but this goes into hand in hand with they think that athenians also would the father decides if the the kid that is born gets to stay a uh, uh, rural farmers would if they had too many mouths to feed they would give up their child to the forest and leave them to the gods which mm -hmm. i believe is one of the main reason why and this myth coming up and so many other myths you see so many different heroes that are left um, left for dead for the the will of the gods, and you gotta you almost have to cope with it. You have to have these heroes overcome this. It's almost like in um, Celtic mythology, the the child that gets sick and dies at an early age is actually a changeling, and what happens is the fairies would come in. They would snatch the the, the healthy baby, and the, the healthy baby would get to live happily ever after with the fairies. And the the baby that was dying would be left in the they'd take the the dead or dying baby out to the forest, um, so they didn't get cursed. But it was their coping mechanism in a world where all of your children are dying at young ages or you can't feed them. You have to have these little things like, oh well, you know what? They took Oedipus, they tied his feet together, and they left him in the woods, and he got divine intervention. So maybe maybe the baby that we left is doing all right. Maybe he's the new hero in Argos. So it's just kind of cool that Whatever you can helps see. You sleep yeah, I was gonna say right? it's kind of cool to see like the the psyche and the mentality of it. Um, and then just the the last element of it is the slaves. So the slaves aren't 
quite like we, we would associate with slaves. These are just the, the, the besieged or sacked cities, the other Greeks typically that were sold into slavery. Um, they would get good treatment, but they were literally, as Aristotle puts it, were the uh, animated tools for the working man. <laughs> so... <laughs> You get a get a good a glimpse nice of, way yeah, of putting it. get a good glimpse of what uh, they felt about them. Yes, <laughs> they did get health care for them. They did make sure that they were provided and fed, but they were just animated tools. <laughs> and then Aristotle also has a, a phenomenous or a phenomenous phenomenal line that kind of gives you a glimpse into how misogynistic he is. He says that the love that a man has for his wife is the love or is to which that the love of a government has for the governed. So lots of romance going on in Athens, Greece. Yeah. <laughs> now you're probably sitting at home wondering, dang, Neil, this is a long intro on explaining Athens. But remember, about two or three episodes, I explained that Athens is about 90% of our myths and almost all of our plays. So having a good idea of understanding what is happening on the surface level of a myth, because all these myths are based on a heroic age. The Athenians didn't believe anymore that these these myths were happening in their era it was a the heroic age of troy which was about 1100 bce and this is a lot of these are written on 500 or so so there's, there's a good 600 years between these myths so they believe that back then that the the gods were more interactive with them there's myths where they're eating with them they're they're having all these different associations with them so it you got to have First, the, the surface level of the myth, so you kind of understand what's going on. But then second, there's two timestamps. The first stamp is 1100 BCE. The second timestamp is it's going to be stuff that is going to relate to the Athenians in that era. So you'll see that the the differences that, like, let's say that the, the, the situations that were important to Homer obviously aren't going to be in the same myths that happened in 500 BCE. So I just wanted to make sure you guys knew these things. So anytime you see... A myth where a a husband is distraught over his wife uh, committing adultery or the, the woman kills her children like Medea does or any of these crazy things that they do. Just realize that this was meant to completely shock and uh, bewilder the audience of Athenian men. So that's, that's all I had. Dustin is going to kick it off. We've got the dawning of the age of Perseus. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're welcome. That was a good intro, by Thank the way. You. Yeah, you know, I do. I do my best. You, you do your thing. So with Perseus, I think we should start with kind of his lineage. Time to go <laughs> back, back, back in time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to start Perseus off with Abbas, who is actually the king of Argus, and his wife, Aglaia. They give birth to twin sons named Acrisius and Proteus. Now, Acrisius and Proteus are at odds with each other, they say, even from the womb. And when they're grown, it's even worse. They actually end up going to war over the kingdom. Fun fact, though, in the course of their fighting, they became the first to develop using shields. I don't know if you knew that or not. Because they were so equal? or It doesn't really say. It just said that in the course of their fighting, they became the first to develop using shields. Okay. So they were probably like, you know what? Instead of just being wide open and taking these spears to the chest, maybe we should, like block it <laughs> maybe, you know what, maybe we need of, something to like deflect things with it's like when duelers for the first time decided to not stand like straight yeah like, looking at them there's like all right maybe if i just turn a little yeah, bit maybe if, uh, hard to hit a moving target yeah. maybe i'll just shimmy a yeah. little bit yeah exactly <laughs> yeah so they're the first to develop using shields now acrisius ends up winning this war over the kingdom of argus and he drives proteus out well, Proteus makes his way to uh, Lycia, and he marries the king, the king there's daughter. And with his new uh, Lycanian army from his father-in-law, he makes his way home, and he actually sees Tyrans, which had been walled for him by the Cyclops. Which is uh, the same same city that we talked about with Theseus. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, wasn't it Heracles? Yeah, Heracles makes his way there, too. Yep. It's pretty common. Yeah. Yep. Now, once he uh, takes Tyrans, uh, him and his brother kind of come to a deal and they split the uh, Argolis. You know, it's like a little land area. They yeah. split it down the middle. He gets Argus and uh, Proteus gets Tyrans. And they kind of settle down and they just yeah. kind of do their own thing. They're still not like tight or anything. Right. It's just kind of a little peace treaty. 
Now, Chryseis, who is the king of Argus now, he visits an oracle to seek advice on uh, the best way to obtain a male male heir. Yep. Common theme. See yeah. This quite often, yeah. Well, the oracle doesn't have anything to say that he wants to hear. And he actually prophesies that his daughter, uh, Danae... Uh, you, can call, you can either say Danae or yeah, Danae. Yeah, Dan, uh, Danae would give birth to a son who would kill him. Which like, is a very typical prophecy like, as well. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I guess I won't. Yeah, well, that's not what I came here to yeah. find out, but thanks, yeah, I guess. I'm pretty sure I paid so you would answer <laughs> whether or not I'd have a son. So, <laughs> But, I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah, great. So, fearing this prophecy, Acrisius, he, he builds a bronze chamber underground, and he locks his daughter in there. Fearing, you know, that he's like, she's locked in a bronze, and she's never getting pregnant. Yeah. Oh, we forgot about Zeus. Yeah. We forgot, <laughs> forgot about the, the good old uh, daddy of thunder. Yep. Zeus will not be deterred. Nope. He has an eye for uh, Danae. And he has an eye for everything. Uh, he does. Yeah. And he, you know, he's like, I'm, I'm going to get it yeah. one way or another. <laughs> so in typical Zeus fashion, he concocts a scheme to have his way with her. And he turns himself into a golden stream, or golden shower, if you will. And he streams through the ceiling and actually down into her womb. I just want to point out that Zeus is the first inspirational man of the I Got Mine. Literally all of his myths. Like, he turns into a, a swan. Great. I mean, I just don't see a swan, you know, being very well endowed. Or yeah. being able to please a woman. Yeah. And then a golden shower? I just, yeah, just, that's just going to leave. all oh, the rain. Oh, that's I'm pregnant. Just got, <laughs> yeah, that's got yeast infection written all over it. Perhaps. You know, I just, <laughs> I just don't see how that could get her, you know. Zeus gets his rocks off, get it, because golden shower. <laughs> Zeus gets his, but she doesn't get hers. And that's like the only time she gets laid, I think, which is kind of a bummer for her. Yeah, I think you might be right. We'll get to that in a second. Tune in next time. <laughs> so... After he streams through the ceiling and into a room, he gets her pregnant and she carries the child this whole time underground and gives birth to him. Hold up. Uh, one thing though. What do you think? Like, do you think she was like, do you think it was that golden shower? No, you don't think that there's no way that you get hit with a golden shower. So you're probably like sitting there like, when the heck did I get pregnant? I don't know. Zeus had a rev. She was probably like, it's, it was probably Zeus. But I mean, you got to think though, like. Just as like a, a normal person, like you're sitting there, like like okay, so what happened that day? I got locked. Well, in. as a normal person, I think you'd be a little suspicious of a golden stream making well, its way into your bronze chamber. You know, I mean, maybe the maybe <laughs> she thought that the tower wasn't made well, but you know, I'm sure she wasn't thinking it, was it got the ground. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure she wasn't thinking that it got her pregnant. Well, that's true. There's a lot of factors into did. this. <laughs> it did. Oh because, boy, did it! Because when Zeus hits his target, it leaves a baby. He don't miss. Yeah. <laughs> So when Acrisius finds out that she had given birth to a son named Perseus, he didn't believe it to be from Zeus because yeah. she said it was from Zeus. Yeah, she's like, well, what happened was from the roof, there was this golden shower that entered me and now I've got baby Perseus. And he's like, mm. hmm. Likely story. Yeah. He immediately suspects it to be his brother Proteus. <laughs> and that causes even more strain. Yeah. So... In response to this, he casts his daughter and Perseus out to sea in, in like, a trunk. Yeah, because just in case. Because, you know, like I said, the family is a huge thing. So he can't technically kill her because that would be not very oikos of him. So what he has to do is he has to leave it up to the gods. When he abandons her and the baby in this chest that he throws into the ocean he's leaving it up to poseidon and he's washing his hands of any yeah. guilt because <laughs> the water yeah was that one intentional or no it wasn't okay, good good so <laughs> it's a common theme that you'll see though that it, it reoccurs so they they have little mental gymnastics that they can do to get out of these things it always comes back to haunt them but they can do it this way indeed yeah anyway the trunk actually ends up washing up on the shores of Seraphis. Where Dictes, brother of King Polydectes, took him in and raised him. Lots of fun puns with that name. Yes. Especially Dictes. Yes. <laughs> God, what a that terrible was, sounds name. Sounds so great when you say it. Right? <laughs> I put a little stank on it. 
Well, later down the line, Polydectes, he, he wanted uh, Danae, but he was unable to have sex with her due to Perseus being a grown man now. And he was he was shook about Perseus because yeah. he's the son of Zeus. So obviously he's athletic and strong and just dope at everything because all of Zeus's kids are. Yeah, I think that a lot of the heroes typically are a little bit taller, like almost like, you know, the, the difference between Goliath they, and David. They stand of, out. Yeah, they, yeah they're, they're, they're bigger. They're not just your average guy. They're like, you know, they're like an NFL player. Right. You know, if you stand next to an offensive lineman or a linebacker, you're gonna tell he's not just your everyday yeah. guy. Yeah, stand, stand by uh, next to LeBron, and you're gonna look pretty inky. Yeah, exactly. If you're tall for your your area. Yep. So he's like, I got to get Perseus out of the picture so I can get with his mama. So. He uh he 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 gathers all of his friends and he includes Perseus, and he tells them that he's collecting uh contributions to offer for the hand of Hippodamia, which is the daughter of Animaeus. And he's saying, "Hey, I want to marry her, and I need contributions. What do you guys got?" Well, he ends up asking uh for horses from everyone, except Perseus, because Perseus did not get a horse. And Perseus had made a comment at some point saying that he would not deny Polydectes even the head of the Gorgo, which yeah. would be Medusa. Yeah, the best way that I've heard this explained is it's like um, <laughs> it's pretty pretty fantastic, uh, um, Professor. I'm gonna post his uh, link on there, but the way that he describes it is, is he's like those cool kids that are outside uh, the the school dance. They're like, I wouldn't go in there even if they asked me to. I bring him the head of the Medusa though, and he's like, hey. I heard that. <laughs> and then he makes him do it. And he's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about yeah. uh, mouth rotten checks yeah, that your ass right. can't exactly. cash. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. It did not work out. Yep. So Polydectes hears this and he's like, well, you know what? That's exactly what I want. I don't need another horse. Yeah. I don't need any more horses. I want you to get me the head of the Gorgo. So Percy's kind of like, oh. All right. <laughs> I, I, I guess I'll back myself yep. in the corner here, but okay. Well, luckily, he had some divine help. Okay. Hermes and Athena serve as his guides on this quest, and they tell him to seek out the Forkides. Okay. Which are the fates, yeah. Yeah, they're the three daughters of uh, Forcus. They're the fates. They were named Inyo, Pafredo, and uh, Dino. Dino. They've got some pretty... We've got some pretty good... Uh... Greek puns going on here. Inyo. Right. <laughs> I can't wait for Percy's to get in yo. Ah, uh, tracking. Yeah. Real smooth. He gets it. <laughs> so the, the three of these sisters, they possess only one eye and one tooth between the three of them. And they have, and they take turns using it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty sanitary. Yeah. Well, <laughs> So Perseus, when he comes there, when he seeks him out, he actually takes the eye and the tooth. And when they demand it back, he says he will return them, but only if they take him to the nymphs. Now, these nymphs were in possession of some powerful tools to help him. One being winged sandals. Wait, no, you mean Pegasus? No, no. I do not mean Pegasus. <laughs> and you know I don't okay. mean Pegasus. But, okay, hear me out. What if? <laughs> what if instead this this is the only way that it would work in my mind if instead Athena comes out like in Clash of the Titans she's leading Pegasus and on it is Bellerophon and Perseus is forced to ride on Pegasus too deep you know kind of like uh, Dumb and Dumber where Perseus is in the back riding like holding on to his waist <laughs> and that's how they fly off to go fight the Gorgon I mean now that is a book or yeah, but, but we both know that's not how it but goes. But it would be so dope. It would be dope. But we're not talking about would-bes, bro. So Pegasus. <laughs> so Pegasus is not in the picture yet. <laughs> it's a pair of winged sandals, which will make him fly. The other is the Helm of Hades, which, as we've mentioned before, turns the wearer invisible. All right. And the third is just a knapsack. That's all it is. There's no special power behind it. It's just a knapsack. It's the power to hold Medusa's head. Yeah, That's it's power powerful. to carry things. Plus, they already gave him Bellerophon and Pegasus <laughs> no, they for didn't. him to ride on. No, they didn't. They did not. Well, and now you people know. are confused. <laughs> yeah, they are confused because of you. Mm. Oh, my God. Working with this guy. Mm. <laughs> 
So once the uh, Forkides uh, led them there, he returned their eye and tooth, and then he approaches the nymphs, who quickly give him the items that he needs. He then flung on the knapsack, tied the sandals on his ankles. Has new kicks. Yep. Well, yeah, you get new kicks, you gotta break them. Yeah. You gotta break them in. And then he puts on the helm. He's also armed with an adamantine sickle. Mm-hmm. Adamantine. Yep. It's been a while since we've talked about it. Yeah, that. it comes around, man. It pops its head up. Yep. Which he obtained from uh, Hermes. And he also has a shield from Athena. So armed with all these, he makes his way to the Gorgon's lair. Flies away. Yep. He is in hot pursuit. Yep. Now, the three Gorgons were named Cithero, Uriel, and Medusa. Medusa was the only was the only mortal of the three. Therefore, that's the one whose head he yeah. had to bring back. Yeah, and that goes back to so. There's numerous different yeah uh, there's different different stories different on it. Medusa interpretations. Yeah. The the one that most people know is the one by um, Ovid, who is the the Roman um, historian. So I'm gonna post on the the website just a a list of all the the sources that we use, so I can kind of give you a, an idea on the the length between the time of the myth and why some of the people I try to avoid using Ovid's one of them because the the story that we've told in the past that's the one with Athena and Poseidon yeah, it's actually on the, the Brosidon yeah episode. it's on the Poseidon episode so in that episode Brosidon is mad at Athena and he takes the priestess Medusa who is her uh, in her temple and he rapes her and Athena is so enraged that she ends up cursing her and then hiding her with the Gorgons so no matter who looks at her will be turned to stone the only problem with this is that's not how the original story goes Hesiod one of the earliest sources that we have he's about 700 to 1000 BCE we're not sure exactly when but he's one of our oldest sources and he just describes that for some reason, she's one of the only ones that are mortal. It doesn't elaborate why. Yeah, it doesn't, not one iota of elaboration. Yeah. It's just, so, hey, this one's mortal, the other two are Yeah, I guess, I guess it's just for, for later on, um, it works out for it. So, I mean, in this time, we're going we're gonna to probably stick with the, the Ovid, because it, it's Ovid and Pausanias, yeah. two of the, the older sources that we, we have to use. So, Yeah, and I know the most famous depiction of a Gorgon is... Like a woman with a snake body, and she's scaly and has snakes for hair, and that's because of Clash of the Titans. Again. Yeah, yeah. She she was a beautiful. In most cases, she either was a beautiful woman or she had like this crazy little, like, I guess it's hard to. It's kind of hard to explain. She had like this crazy demon face with giant fangs, wings, and just like a regular body though. Um, and there's some pretty funny vase paintings on there. So you know, take a look at those too. Yeah, but. She, she doesn't look like what we think she looks like. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, according to uh, Pseudo Apollodorus, the Gorgon's heads were entwined with the horny scales of serpents, not actual serpents, but just like scales. But Apollodorus was later, too, though. Yeah, I know. Unfortunately. I'm just going yeah. by. He, he said. Unfortunately, he's one of the most complete that we can use. Yeah. So that's why we have to use him. Stupid yeah. Hesiod. Well, also, uh, according to him, other than horny scales of serpents on their head, they had big tusks like hogs, bronze hands, which oh. I don't know how that plays well, anything. I mean, fisticuffs, that plays a lot. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> yeah, I guess you don't want to catch yeah. those hands. Yeah. Even if you close your eyes, you're getting, you're getting some brass yeah. knuckles. You're oh, losing, losing teeth for sure. Brass knuckles, nailed it. Maybe and that's that, where they get it from. That is exactly where they get it from now. And they also had wings of gold on which they flew. Hmm. So it's, Seems kind of unnecessary. Yeah, on top of that, they also... Anyone that looked at them, they turned them into stone. So they could just fly around, turn everyone to stone, I guess, if they wanted to. Well, good thing they didn't. Right? Yeah. So Perseus, therefore, with Athena guiding his hand, he kept his eyes on the reflection in the shield. That way he wouldn't have to directly look at any of them in the face and turn to stone. So he's walking over the sleeping Gorgons. He's looking in the shield's uh, reflection at everything. And when he sees the image of Medusa, he immediately beheads her. And from the blood that dripped from her head sprang Pegasus. So Perseus could not have rode Pegasus to Medusa because 
Pegasus wasn't born until Medusa's death. Yeah, but I like my version better. With yeah, the, 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 I think that you know what I'm. I, I'm gonna commission. I don't like your you know, version. If you guys like it, tell me because I'm gonna commission some shirts <laughs> with Perseus riding behind Bellerophon on Pegasus with his head on his shoulder. This. Mm. This is asinine. This, this is going to be our logo from this, now on out. <laughs> this, this is asinine because in the Bro Sign episode, you talked about how angry you yeah. were that people think that yeah, Pegasus this is. This because is that takes about. away from your boy Bellerophon. Yeah, well, he's coming. Don't worry, guys. Yeah. TikTok. <laughs> Click clack. Yep. Oh, nice. Okay. Also born from the blood, though, was uh, Chrysor. Chrysor. Chrysor, who is actually the father of Garion. Yep, we he saw him pretty, in uh, the Heracles myth. He was one of the labors. Yep, pretty, he's pretty dope too. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of big big name drops going on. But one thing that always kind of bothered me about the Perseus myth, when why he's not my favorite, is it's just so anticlimactic. It's like reading a Stephen King book. Like you get all this cool stuff. It's like the build up. You're like, oh shoot, he's gonna go kill the kill Medusa, and then Medusa's dead. Mm-hmm. She's sleeping. Just, hey, they're all sleeping. Slice. Yep. Yep. And you're like, you know, it's like when you're reading the book It, you're a thousand pages in and all of a sudden someone shouts, you're not real. I don't believe you. And the giant monster goes, ah, and dies. That easy all along. It was. So Stephen King, figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Call out Stephen King. <laughs> yeah. I know you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'd actually, I'd shit if you was right. <laughs> like, <laughs> That'd be wild if you just get a strongly written letter yeah. and like he does, he unsubscribes. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be crazy. So after he beheads Medusa, Perseus then places the head in his knapsack, his, mm-hmm. his magical knapsack yeah. <laughs> that carries things, his magical money bag. Yep. And he heads back with the Gorgon, uh, with the two other Gorgons in hot pursuit. Yes. But, remember, he's got the helmet of Hades on, so he's invisible. And that actually makes it impossible for them to identify him. So, eventually, they just give up because they're just chasing a ghost. That would still be terrifying. It would be. Yeah. He's actually, fun fact, he's the only hero that's ever depicted running from a female. So, in vases. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and in the vases or vase paintings, they always depicted, like, a, it was, like, the abduction phase. So, like, Apollo chasing Daphne or something like that. He's the only one that they depict as it. And they think that I actually told you I went down this rabbit hole. So they think that a lot of the, the vase painters had like a sense of humor and stuff. Who knew? And they, <laughs> they made a lot of comedic uh, vases. And I'm just telling you, if you just type in, you know, funny or yeah, funny ancient Greek vases, you'll find some golden ones. Okay. You know, and it's well worth going down the rabbit hole for a couple hours and forgetting to do the podcast stuff for a couple of days. <laughs> Even Sometimes a, you got to take yeah. your mind off and get a little break. Yeah, I, even, I even bought a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> I like <laughs> but, that. <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, he definitely got chased. Yes, he did. Yep. So once he loses their trail and he's flying home, Perseus arrives in Ethiopia, which was ruled by uh, Cepheus. And while he's flying over there, he sees the daughter of Cepheus, Andromeda, laid out as a meal for a sea monster or kraken. Not a kraken. I know it's not a kraken, but that's the most famous depiction of this sea monster is a kraken. Do you know, Dustin? Release the kraken! Do you know where the kraken originates? I I believe it's uh, Norwegian, right? That's incorrect. The term kraken. Oh, no. It is actually a Tennessean poet from 1830. It was Alfred Tennyson called Mm. the kraken. (laughs) That's (laughs) literally what it was called. I thought it was going to be way, way more, more impressive yeah. than that. Yeah, it was pretty anticlimactic. It was a lot <laughs> like the Perseus myth. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, you got yep. me there. Yep. <laughs> yep. So once he sees Andromeda laid out as a meal for the sea monster, he instantly falls in love with her and wants to save her. Well, real quick, let me explain to you how Andromeda got there. It seems the king's wife, Cassiopeia, yep. had challenged the... Uh, uh, the Nereides, who are the daughters of Poseidon, mm-hmm. in beauty, boasting that she outdid them all. Which is Poseidon's wife is one of them. Yes, Poseidon's wife is one of them as well, yeah. yes. Oops. Now, the Nereides were enraged by this. Yeah. And Poseidon, in kind of a sympathetic anger, sent a flood tide upon the land and a sea monster as well. Like, you know, you're not not going to diss my fam. Yeah. 
and you know made it rain on him. Yeah. <clears throat> He's like, you know what? I'm gonna throw some water at him and a monster. And some shade. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about the shade, but definitely the other stuff. Yep. The or uh, so the Oracle of Amon prophesies an end to this trouble. And the only way the, the end would come is if uh Cassiopeia's daughter, Andromeda, were served up to the sea monster as a sacrifice. Yeah, and, and it's important to note, too, so the, the Oracle of Amon, that is actually um, who that area the Greeks associated with Zeus. So in the, the great conquest of Alexander the Great, when he is he tracks through the desert after conquering Egypt, he goes there to this Oracle and asks them if uh, all of the, the murderers of his father had been punished because obviously people believe that it was probably him and it probably was him or his mother or something of the yeah. sort. So Zeus, the the Greeks believe that Zeus was everywhere. And this myth kind of helps explain that too. Um, Cause Perseus is here, you know, son of him, you know, here to, here to do his bidding. Indeed. Indeed. So as I was saying, the only way to uh, end this trouble is to serve up Andromeda as a sacrifice to the sea monster. But, uh, the king, Cepheus, he really doesn't want to do it because that's his daughter. But he ends up being pressured by the Ethiopian, you know, his people. So he's like, all right, I got to do what I got to do. So he ties his daughter out on a rock. And that's when Perseus sees her. And like I said, when he sees her, he instantly falls in love with her. And he promises the king to kill the sea monster in return for her hand in marriage. Yeah, he's like, you know, good things my mom always taught me one thing. Don't do anything for free. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah, I'll save your daughter, but it's going to cost you. Yeah, but she's marrying me if I save her. Yeah. So oaths, some oaths were sworn. Yep. After which Perseus faced the sea monster. Yeah, his and, name is Ketus. Yes. Ketus. Which he defeats the sea monster because he's got those winged shoes, so he's able to dodge everything the sea monster has for a little bit. Yeah. For a little bit. He's got the helm of Hades so he can be invisible. I believe he takes out the sea monster's eyes. That's how he gets the upper hand on him. Yeah. He, so through his agility, he's just swimming. Like he swarms in there. He comes in for the, the first strike. He hits it with the, the sword and he hits his eyeball for the first one. And the blood splatters everywhere. It makes his, his, uh, his sandals start to lose grip. He's starting to get a little bit lower. And then the monster starts slashing at him and he, dives and he ducks and he dodges and then he hits the other eye and then all of a sudden it can still smell him so mm -hmm. he's just like dodging again he's like i'll save you he's trying to fly but he can't he keeps hitting it in the water so he's like uh-oh and he's like -ka! kills him that was haunting yeah that was a haunting scene yeah you know You're <laughs> well done good sir he did the five five d's of dodge yeah. dodge duck dip dive and dodge <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he did. Yep. Didn't mean to die, but he did. Yes. So he ends up slaying the monster, and he sets Andromeda free. So they are to be married. Now, this causes a little problem, because uh, Cepheus' brother Phineas was previously set to wed Andromeda, and he's pretty upset that he doesn't get to now. I mean, where were you when she was about to get eaten, bro? I mean... <laughs> well, I mean, he probably didn't know. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did, too, but, you know, we don't, <laughs> we don't know, okay? Okay. So he conspires against Perseus, but Perseus learns of the plot and ends up displaying Medusa's head to Phineas and his goons, and he turns him instantly to stone. Yeah, I believe there's like some type of dinner or something. something yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like a... It's like a it's like almost, wedding dinner. Yeah, it's or like something? almost like a, a scene out of The Outsiders where like, you know, he's got his posse, he's got, or, you know, Perseus has his, and then he's got his. Greasers and, and the socials. Like, they're all like... You know, getting their switchblades going, like in unison, making some music with them, you know? And then he's like, then he's like, <laughs> everyone, <laughs> that's my notebook, Solon. And then he's like, everyone that is my friend, turn away. And then he's like, ah! <laughs> like, and that's why they call me Stone Cold. Yes. And then he popped two beers yeah. and, and chugged and them. Then he looked at him and he goes, don't ever take me for granted. <laughs> yeah. I see yeah. what you did there. Yeah. I feel like you've been waiting to use that. I have been. <laughs> What do you mean? Everything I do is spontaneous. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you are the poster child of spontaneity. Yep. So after all this happens, he decides to return home. So when he reaches uh, Seraphis, Perseus finds his mother and Dictus seeking refuge at the altars 
due to the violence of Polydectes. So Polydectes yeah. has been just been going crazy wild, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Do some crazy things to his mom. Yep. Mm. Yeah, so he ain't too happy about that. Yeah. So he rolls up into the royal palace where Polydectes was entertaining his friends, and he turns his own face away and displays the head of Medusa. And when they looked at it, each one turned to stone, holding the exact pose they were making at that exact moment. Yep. So I imagine they looked pretty, pretty silly. Yeah, do, you think he, do you think he kept him there, or do you like think he like knocked him over? I, I bet he kept him there. Perhaps. Yeah, I bet he did. I mean, you never know. No, he did. No, no one messes with Perseus's mommy. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. He might have instead of keeping him, you know, they're, they're as like decoration, back. he might have just broke him. Nah, nah, because then you get to you get to use it as like a. You know what happens when you mess with me? I might, I might still have that. It. I might still have that head. Yeah. No one knows. Yeah, so I got, what if, so what if the mist says I gave it to Athena? Yeah, I got my winged sandals resting yeah. on this guy. Yeah. Yeah, what, what's Athena got to do with it? <laughs> it was me and Bellerophon. Bellerophon. <laughs> So after this happens, Perseus then makes Dictes king of Seraphis. And he gives the sandals, knapsack, and helm back to Hermes, who brings those back to the nymphs. He then gives Medusa's head to Athena, who places the head in the center of her shield. The, the legendary Aegis. Yep, that's exactly what it is. So once all that matter settled, Perseus, with his wife and mother then hurried on the Argus in order to get a look at uh, Acrisius. But as soon as Acrisius learned of this, he left Argos, still fearful of the Oracle, obviously, of the right. Oracle's prophecy. Yeah, and he probably also didn't want to explain why he put his daughter and grandson, who just killed the, killed the Gorgon. Yeah. You know, it's like, I mean, it's one thing when, like, you know, it's a baby. Now that he's, he's dope enough to kill a, a sea monster and the gorgon granted i know you probably lost some cool points riding on the back of medusa or uh back of pegasus like that but <laughs> oh my god you know what you're just doing that to make me mad now <laughs> you win some you lose some though you know yeah you get give, some stuff a points. little get a little yeah. so when he learns of this he left argos still fearful of the oracle's prophecy obviously and he moved to the uh pelasgian land not sure where that is yeah I don't know if you know or not. I don't. Uh, that was one that I'm not familiar with. Yeah, so I'm, not, I'm sure. not familiar with that one either. But yeah, he took refuge there. But when uh, Tutadmides, okay, king of the uh, Larisaeans, he staged an athletic contest, kind of like a little miniature Olympics, yep. to honor his departed father. Now Perseus immediately was on hand to enter. He's like, yeah. yeah, I love me some, some games. I'm down. Yeah, and he also, he just invented some, like the, the part of the, the, um, the, one of the events where they, they throw the, the ball. He had like this little cloth that he used to make him go further. <laughs> and that's where things go awry. Kind of like a shot put. Yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah. Makes sense. So he competed in the, uh, pentathlon, mm -hmm. but, while he was throwing the discus, now this is where it gets wild. <laughs> what are the odds of this, yeah. right? He throws the discus and it hits Acrisius, who's in the crowd, on the foot and killed him then and there. Yep. Bummer. <laughs> I mean. Now that's some athlete's foot. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of that one. Come on. Yeah. That one was spontaneous. It was it was spontaneous. Man. Damn it. Killing it. <laughs> Killing it. Hate giving you credit. Thank you. <laughs> so once uh, so after uh, Chrisius dies by getting hit on the foot with a discus, that is when Perseus kind of understood that the Oracle's promise had been fulfilled. So he buried a Chrisius outside the polis. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that earlier. And then he was too ashamed to enter Argos and claim the, you know, Brown. estate yeah. of the man who had died because of him. So he went to Proteus' son, uh, Megapenthes, instead at Tyrans, and he made a trade with him. He handed him over Argus, so Megapenthes ruled the Argives, and Perseus ruled Tyrans as well as Medea and uh, Messina, both of which he walled off. And this is where, this is a kind of little fun fact. I thought that this would be fun to talk about and bring up. Perseus actually ends up being an ancestor of Heracles, 
not just through Zeus. Mm. Zeus is both of their fathers, but <laughs> um, Hercules' mom, Heracles' mom, is Perseus's granddaughter. Yep, so he is the great-great-grandfather and the father. Congratulations, Alabama. Yeah, Zeus, You've been outdone. Zeus can pull anything off, can he? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty wild factoid you guys yeah. might enjoy. <laughs> yeah, but he got it in. You know, he always does. All right, Dustin. I had a surprise for you. Wait, what was yours? Um, I, I thought we were going to do the uh, War of Dionysus. We can, but I want... I'm you chomping at the bit here. Okay, you ready? Okay. <clears throat> Lay it on me. What is Medusa's favorite cheese? What? Gorgon or Gorgonzola. <laughs> I hate you so much. All right, and then oh my god, there's what, more. Yeah, there's more. But wait, <laughs> there's more. What would happen if a Pomeranian looked in Medusa's eyes? I don't know, bro. It becomes a pomegranate. <laughs> <laughs> my god. <laughs> All right, I've got two more. <laughs> <laughs> what do people do at a party with Medusa? They get stoned. I was just going to say that, actually. <laughs> All right, here's the last one. This one's the best one. This okay, best lay it on me. What did Medusa call the sheep that she turned to stone? What? Basalt. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> that one was a leg slapper. Ba-dum. I'm out. That's yep. it, guys. You know I'm what? out. <laughs> we, had, we had another segment, but I'm done. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. done. I can't do it Before anymore. we get into your part, um, so just recapping just a little bit there so we saw elements of kind of what i led into at the intro so andromeda's mother talks smack to are about being more beautiful than poseidon's wife and then because the the gods don't punish like a normal like, like what we would think that a god would do they punish the whole polis so this is there's two elements to this the first reason why they do this is obviously these myths are going to be spread because they want to keep their people in line so what better propaganda than saying, hey, maybe you guys should just stop, you know, doing things that we tell you not to because then maybe the gods will probably send a sea monster and then you have to sell your daughter to the sea monster. Probably Perseus isn't going to come and save it because, you know, gods don't do that anymore. You know, maybe don't do that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. So that's one element to it. And then the secondly, <laughs> it just, it really helps them have the family pride. So by forcing them to have the family pride where they'll still bury even... Even Perseus, he kills his own grandpa by accident, or yeah, grandpa by accident, and still buries him because it's expected of him. He, by the Greek tradition, he is still supposed to give his family members the rightful burial. In Athens, uh, even if he was abused, he was and was disowned by the family. If the family member dies, they have to come back to Athens. And give them a proper burial, or their family lineage will be cursed. Hmm. So there's there's just embedded a lot of stipulations. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it. I'm sure a lot of people didn't follow them. They're like oh, you know what, I'm I'll sure. take the curse. He can just be you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. I ain't scared of no curse. Yeah, I, I doubt they said that. I just thought you don't know that. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. I don't. I do know. That Bellerophon <laughs> and Perseus were the greatest duo that ever lived. Oh, they weren't a duo. The original tag team. You know what? What if it? What if this is someone new, new to Greek mythology listening, and they don't know the story at all? Well, they, and you're just filling their head with nonsense. They picked a very random episode, like way into the show, to not realize that I just throw stuff out there sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's fair, yeah. but go back to episode like two or three, guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Co- or Cody, <laughs> our producer has nothing for us. Yeah, Dustin Cody. has an extra story. <laughs> Cody, that's a joke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's the funniest joke you've told all day. Uh, it was Cody. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that that basalt one was phenomenal. Get over yourself. I literally knee slapped. Get over yourself. <laughs> I know you knee slapped. I watched you. Damn it. <laughs> that's good. The last little bit we wanted to talk about was it was kind of a brief little war between. Perseus and the god Dionysus. Heck yeah. Let's do it. Do you know what exactly started it? Um, I think he was spreading his religion like he did because he mm-hmm. was really weird. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what started it. Perseus too. is like, yeah, you know what? I saw what you did at Thebes and I got to tell you, I don't love Not it. Not a fan. Yeah. 
I I've been protecting my mom, and I'd rather her not rip me from limb from limb. Yeah. So well. As uh, we've talked about in the Dionysus episode, his followers aren't your normal. In the maintenance, actually, no. It was uh, Hera caused it. It was caused by Hera. That's was, it was it? Yeah, yeah. Because it, so it's hard to get. The reason That's why we're not one hundred percent sure there there's a lot that there's there, there's so many different like versions. six different sources that only give us like a paragraph of the story, so it, it's tough. So he he rolls up with his crew and uh, Percy's like, "Yo." Um, that's a no for me. So you gotta go on. Yeah. Get. And Nineties is like, no, I'm that's that's not how I go. Um, I kinda got my friends here, you're kinda making me look like a punk. And person's like, Well, you know, do well, it. Well you are a punk. Yeah. Get up out of yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> and they ended up fighting and Perseus kills in um Ariadne, which if you remember back to the Theseus episode, she got ditched on an island because yeah. she talked too much it's not just that he killed ariadne you got to remember dionysus's followers they're they're not a lot of male followers yeah it's all women mm-hmm. and satyrs yep so that's pretty much what his army consists of so ariadne is actually a member of this army yeah. and she was on the battlefield and she was killed by perseus but since due to her status she wasn't just buried with the rest of them she got like a little tomb yeah and in some of this he went and went back and got her yeah and that's when he uh, ran into that that shepherd in that episode where he's like, yeah, if you uh, if you get me into the underworld and back, uh, I'll let you be my lover. And then he died. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to make him a penis plant. Yes. <laughs> that That's pretty much the same thing. Good old penis plant. <laughs> like, sometimes the gods. I, just I don't should get plant it. some of those somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just the gods and their their mentality. They're, they're very strange. Indeed, they are. <laughs> so the next episode. Well... Like, uh, I was gonna say, there's really nothing. Uh, there's really nothing about the death of Perseus. There's like one source that says yeah. Proteus ended up killing him over something, but yeah, he's one of the few that lives happily ever after. Yeah, he's a Disney princess, really. Yeah, Bellerophon was Prince Charming. No, oh my god. <laughs> 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 you know the best part is like you don't even know it's getting set up. That's it. Then, I'm yeah, stripping bye. down. I'm yeah. swelling up on you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> is, I'm about to Play-Doh you right now. Yep. <laughs> it's about to get all Play-Doh-y yeah. up in here. Right, so the next episode that we're doing is going to be Oedipus. Um, it's going to be the famous playwright, and Dustin's going to get cultured a little bit. I'm going to make him read some playwrights. <laughs> I'm going to get cultured. Yeah, I'm going to... Because I'm so uncultured. Yeah, he's an uncultured swine. Yeah, I'm... He's just talking about getting naked. I'm such a barbarian. I'm a savage. So thanks again, guys. I'm sorry that this episode wasn't as long as Heracles, but, you know, it's it's tough to follow. It is tough to follow. Not everyone can be Heracles and have a bunch of myths. So yeah. kind of came back down to earth with Perseus because he doesn't have nearly as much material. But right. It's a shame that Bellerophon's going to just crap all over him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Beler- <laughs> Bellerophon's going to put everyone to shame. There's actually, here's a fun fact for you. There was a running joke that whenever like you know birds would poop on him, they thought it was Bellerophon on Pegasus just taking a dump on him. That's can't be true. It might be. It's not. <laughs> it's, it's not, but it, I mean... <laughs> Come on, Greeks. What are you doing? I mean, it might as well be. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> how hilarious would it be? Like, if he was like, I'm just so far above those little peasant ants down there and just, like, takes a dump on them. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past good old Bellerophon. I, just, I can't even imagine going about my day and just, like, fecal matter. Like, obviously not bird poop. Yeah, just, like, like human feces. Yeah, human huge turd hit me <laughs> in the face. Talk about a day ruiner. Yep. Maybe it's good luck, though. A day beginner. Yeah. Perseus would have enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> it's been a fun episode. Indeed um, it has. Uh, we'll see you guys next uh, two weeks from now. Yep, Thanks. two weeks from now. Oedipus. <laughs> Oedipus. Be there.